topic of this presentation is really how do we select patients in aesthetic surgery? We all know that many times a patient comes to you with certain expectations that we think we can meet. And then once we meet those expectations, how that patient responds is not always so clear to us. So how can we use technology to better define um, what the patient experience is and how to select patients? That's really the question. So just uh, my disclosure, I'm founder and developer of wikiplasticsurgery.com. It's a patient-based uh, education website um, to learn about different plastic surgery procedures. So how are we going to assess these patients preoperatively, and how can we measure their subconscious emotions using brain emotion computer interfaces? And I'll show you a demonstration of this device. This is an old algorithm by Dr. Goldman, published in PRS, and it's essentially what we do today. The, the algorithm goes, we see a patient, we have a history and physical, and if there's any kind of psychopathologic history present, we may have them see a psychiatrist and have the psychiatrist evaluate. And if there's any kind of indication that this patient is not fit for surgery, we would not operate on them. Or if the patient doesn't have realistic expectations, or if we just don't have good rapport, if we don't get along with the patient, if we don't think that the patient is fit for us to operate on them, we would exclude them from surgery. And this is kind of the model that most people are using. So really, we want the patient to come to us in this green zone, you know, they're happy, they are eager, maybe they're nervous, but their expectations and our abilities are aligned. And the worst thing is to find those patients and think that we can make, meet their expectations and have them come back to us upset, anxious, and disappointed. So we have a lot of technology that helps us identify uh, what the patient's desires are and what our abilities are and how we can align those things. So we have uh, Canfeld makes the Vectra 3D device as well as a more portable handheld device. And there's also iPad devices that can be used to see where our patient is, uh, what they're looking for, and what we can achieve, and to see how we can align those two things. And these technologies have actually been very useful because I can tell you, um, for example, in different regional areas, uh, patients have different expectations. And, and it's very useful to see, for example, in a facial aesthetic surgery patient, what they are looking to achieve. And, and to have that seen in a model is extremely useful. And there are many different types of models. Here is the Vizia um, you know, skin texturing uh, camera where you can see how different skin treatments are affecting patients. There are many different very precise measurements that can be done on rhinoplasty patients. And looking at volumetric studies um, in patients to show them what the difference may have been with filler or with facelifting. So uh, I have a particular interest in rhinoplasty. I think it's a very uh, challenging area of plastic surgery. It's a functional and aesthetic um, component directly in the middle of someone's face. And it's very interesting that although we have many um, ideal measurements and proportions, it doesn't really mean much if the patient's not happy at the end. And there's so many moving parts where you're changing the dorsum, it may change the tip, you may change the alar bases, the columella, that it's very important to know exactly where the patient is, what they want to achieve, and what we can achieve, because there are different cultural and societal norms that are different uh, for what patients are looking for. Same thing with breast. If you look at breast augmentation, I can tell you in Dallas, Texas, uh, C-cup breast is viewed very differently than in Boston, Massachusetts. So it's critically important to know exactly where that patient stands so you don't make an error. So how do we manage expectations? How do we improve our patient selection using technology? So the answer is you kind of need to find a way to get into the patient's brain and see what they're thinking. And how do you do that? How can you because sometimes the patient's feeling one thing and saying something else, and it's really difficult. Uh, you have to have a real sense for who you want to operate on and, and make sure that you're operating on the right people that, with the right expectations. So there's a lot of different technology that can be used, and some of it is uh, limited by cost and complexity. Um, the most well-known uh, imaging devices for the brain uh, use metabolic activity or blood flow, and that would be functional MRIs and PET scans. The problem is, you know, they're very expensive. It's very unrealistic to use it in an aesthetic practice, and, um, and it's, it's prohibitively expensive. EEG, uh, you know, is affordable, available. The first EEG was done a long time ago, 1929, by Hans Berger in Germany. And um, actually, EEG is ideal because it measures the direct electrical activity of the brain. And the electrical activity in a particular neuron of the brain moves between you know, 0.5 millimeters to uh, 0.5 milliseconds to 130 milliseconds in speed, and EEG can uh, catch it at that temporal speed. So I was thinking about these things and seeing our patients, and I came across serendipitously a video just like this, which I'll show you. Lee's revolutionary headset records our brain waves and translates them into meaningful data 
that's easy to understand. And now we can start to see okay. your brain. And is this really what's going on in this my is brain right your now? Your brain in real time. Wow. This might be pretty cool after all, in a Jedi kind of way. The headset is actually an EEG that sends information about my brain wirelessly to a computer or smartphone. We are able to see the dynamics of how the brain is changing and which part is interacting and how it's then um, exchanging information to a different region of the brain and how those um, regions synchronize and desynchronize. So I thought this was very interesting. This is a device called Emotive. It's a 14-channel EEG device, commercially available, costs less than $1,000. And um, the whole idea is that it's basically a brain-computer interface. So it reads your EEG and has an output on a computer. So this is how it looks. I actually have it here if you, uh, we can pass it around. And the output comes in two different ways. You can either get raw EEG data, as seen here, so it shows you the alpha waves, theta waves, and it can be interpreted by somebody who understands EEG. Or um, it can be translated for you, and it can be translated into emotion. So for example, it'll show you stress, excitement, focus, interest. And this is all happening in real time as the patient is experiencing something. Um, and it can, it, multiple different outputs, it can show you percentages, and it has a lot of different algorithms which are very useful. Beyond that, there's actually a lot of things that this device can be applied to. So for example, um, there have been studies putting these EEG devices on different family members. So a family of four, two adults, two children, they go on vacation. And there's actually a video of this of a family in Singapore. And each of them wears the EEG device. And it shows, well, you know, the kids enjoyed this part of the day the most. And this was the most stressful for the parents. So it's almost becoming a Fitbit for your brain. And um, it's readily available to the point that it may be the case. You know, at what points of your day are you most stressed or most focused? And trying to figure that out is important. Brain control technology, particularly in the gaming industry, is a huge area. Uh, you don't need to use remote controls anymore. There have been uh, examples of you playing a video game with your thoughts using this device. Uh, research and education, as we're using, and also marketing, as you would imagine, what are people most interested in? What do they gravitate to? So it has many different applications, and it's a very exciting area of technology. So looking back at plastic surgery patients, what are the components? What are the basic components of someone's emotions? And, and at what point can we interject and gain data to help select patients. So in a very simplistic way, a patient has a subjective experience. And in our case, the subjective experience is taking a preoperative image, adjusting it to our anticipated postoperative result, and seeing how the patient may respond. Now, we're going to get a response that they're going to express to us, but the goal is to get data on their physiologic response before they even communicate to you and see how that may align with their expressive response. And the nice thing about this is, this is culturally universal. Happiness, sadness, nervousness is universal among cultures, and there's not much gray area in terms of that. So really, you want to catch, you know, somebody may seem cool or collected, you want to see what their physiologic response is. And beyond EEG, there's a number of different technologies that you can incorporate to make that more precise. So uh, in the marketing industry, they use these eye tracking devices under the computer screen that very precisely measures your pupillary movements. And because of that, they can tell you when you design an advertisement, what parts of the advertisement you gravitate to first. And actually, it moves in a Z pattern. Most people don't center their eyes in the middle first. They go in kind of a Z direction to scan the advertisement. Uh, there's other types of sensors. Uh, most interestingly to me, there's a, a sensor for electrodermal activity. It can measure the bioimpedance. It can measure uh, minor sweat function. It can measure papillary movement of your hair in a very precise way to see kind of what you're emotionally feeling at a subconscious level and try to um, correlate that to the EEG device. So this is the EEG device, and I'll just show you. Basically, you put it on. It's a 14-channel EEG device. It works by Bluetooth, and it gives you an output. It shows you different emotional responses at a given time, and it also shows you how, uh, what areas of the brain are kind of uh, lighting up at what time, where the activity is. So I became very interested in this, and I came across uh, a gentleman called Scott Chazerat in, in the UK. And he's a photographer, and this was probably about a year ago. And uh, he was interested in technology and photography and art. And what he did, actually, was he took photos of people, and he made dozens of versions of them on Photoshop. And he put the EEG device on and essentially showed them all the images of themselves and selected their ideal self-image based on no communication, all subconscious EEG. And this project of his really went pretty viral. It actually crashed his website, he told me. 
Step one. Um, this is the project. The subject is photographed in the studio, expressionless and with all temporary features such as hair, makeup, jewelry and clothing, either minimized or removed. The aim is to isolate the permanent facial features. Step two. Dozens of versions of the original portrait are produced, each one a new but essentially recognizable face. These versions involve manipulations which either adhere to the scientifically established canons of beauty or go against them, thus changing the perceived character of the subject. Step three. The subject is connected to a brain scanner and watches a slideshow of versions of their own face for the first time. In this way, the immediate emotional reactions can be recorded accurately. The following data analysis allows us to establish which image they prefer without having to ask them verbally. So the most interesting thing I found looking at uh, Scott's pre and ideal image uh, pictures is that oftentimes it doesn't correlate to what we view as ideal aesthetic measurements or ideal aesthetic proportions. It's very individualized. And uh, to me it was very interesting that he was able to hone in on that without any communication. It was all subconscious. And uh, it was quite an interesting project. So what we did, this is uh, at Mass General, um, we put this device on patients using the Vectra 3D to see how they're responding to different changes. And I'll, I'll show you. Um, this is uh, how the device is, is worn. It's a Bluetooth device. Eric is here and we are going to demonstrate how our... So this is just a demonstration on a, on a person, how we would works. be able to do this. And the device is connected and on. And we can see here, um, it's attached to our computer screen um, through Bluetooth. And we can see how all the channels are connected and working well. So we're going to go ahead and take her uh, uh, pre-op photo and change it and see how she responds subconsciously through her EEG. And here's the, here's the demonstration. So with her, we used an extreme example where we were really changing her facial proportions uh, more so than we otherwise would just to get a response. But as you can see, uh, when we rapidly do this in uh, fast forward, changing her lower lip, making her unesthetic almost, uh, gives you a real real time view. Her excitement is just shoots up, it's maxed out. Her focus is going up. Um, her interest is slowly rising. So it gives you a sense without any communication verbally what she's feeling, what she's thinking. And this technology is still requires refinement but we may imagine that at some point it may be combined with imaging software, uh, projected pre-op software to get a better sense of how a patient may be uh, mentally feeling about your, uh, your anticipated plan. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm glad to take any questions. That was a great presentation. I thank really you. enjoyed it. Thank um, you very much. Have you thought of using it to maybe screen for BDD, body dysmorphic disorder? Yes, it's actually uh, something we have thought about. The problem is uh, finding those patients and then doing it. But I think that would be an excellent idea because as we know, there's a higher incidence than most people know. And uh, those patients can be really challenging. Luckily, the ones that really have serious pathology we can identify in physical exam but, and the history in physical, but uh, I think that would be a, a huge value. Once again, an excellent presentation with a Thank you. great amount of future in it from defense industry to cosmetic surgery, as you've put it. Thank you. Now, I cannot understand, uh, there are two questions. What are the ethical implications of it? Because it, it completely gets out of your thought processes and it's going directly to you. The second thing is that the, the, the frequencies and amplitudes that you're picking up from the amygdala, if I may ask you if that is the truth. Uh, is it the amygdala, which is the frequency and amplitude of the EEGs that you are putting up and picking up with? It that is. would be different in every individual. So how do you uh, how do you individualize those uh, those those individuals in which you're going to see some particular frequencies and amplitudes, and then correlate it, it yes. with happiness or or, sure. or excitement so or whatever it's a, it is? It's a great question. So uh, first, um, thank you for your question. The the question about ethical implications are, are well taken. There have been many papers written about biometric measurements, particularly in defense, as you mentioned, security. At the airports, they were thinking about using this type of technology. You know, instead of questioning someone, wouldn't it be interesting to have a pupillary monitor on them and see how their, almost like a lie detector test would work, um, very similarly. Um, so there are ethical implications. We had to have an IRB for this. 
and uh, moving forward, I, I agree. I think it's, it's a very interesting thought, uh, getting into someone's head and kind of seeing where they're feeling is not, is not such an easy uh, thing ethically. In terms of uh, the actual technology, before you do, uh, depending on the mode you're using, so if you're doing uh, controlling a, a car, for example, and there's videos actually online of someone controlling a Tesla using this device. It's unbelievable. I didn't put it in because it's not so relevant, but, but it's unbelievable uh, what you can do. In a lot of those different models, you have to train, you have to calibrate the device to you. So, you know, they'll say, open your eyes, close your eyes, do this, do this. So it's, it has to be calibrated. Thank you, very, thank you very much for the presentation. So my uh, idea was that how can we find out if the patient has a realistic expectations from the procedure and is she or he will be happy after the procedure? Is this something we can Yeah, use so, this so that's the goal. I think it's preliminary. I think this is a very preliminary application. But as this becomes more calibrated, it may give us a sense um, in real time when we're changing the person's projected image if they become more anxious or if they become more nervous rather than calm and satisfied, it may give us an indication of where they stand. It's still early, but I think it'll be an interesting potential technology to incorporate with our pre-op assessment.